favor de sentarse y descansar. So we began last week our conversations around the first letter of John, which last week we looked at as an invitation to a transformed life, an invitation to a process of transformation that slowly molds us into the very image of Christ, the one who was from the beginning. And we talked about how for John in this letter, the first step in that transformation is to recognize and utilize the gift and the tool of forgiveness. To understand that we need to be forgiven and that we need to forgive. And that that first step, that acknowledgement of need and the ability to receive it is the beginning point for that journey of actually being transformed into the likeness of Jesus. Today, John talks about a second step. And that step is the step of learning to live a life that is congruent, where what we say and what we do are one and the same. And he, and he tells us that forgiveness is the tremendous gift that God has given to enable us to be able to get an incongruent life back into congruence. Does that make sense? That it is through forgiveness as we recognize the places of incongruity in our lives, where what we do and what we say are not the same thing, it is forgiveness that is the path to help us unite that again. And so I want to talk today about that idea of living a congruent <clears throat> life. A life where, as some say, we walk the walk and talk the talk, and we walk the talk. All of that comes together as one. Now, there are a number of phrases in this particular text that hearken back to or echo some of the central themes that are part of John's gospel. I told you last week that this letter, we don't know for sure that John wrote it, but it clearly comes out of a community that was shaped by the gospel of John and possibly by the apostle John's own teaching. And there are a couple of themes that just stand out in today's text that connect back to John's gospel. The first is he says, we can know that we have known him if we obey his commandments, in particular, his commandment to love one another. Many of you will recall that on Maundy Thursday every year, Maundy, which means commandment, right? The text that we read is from John chapter 15, where Jesus says to his disciples on that last night before he is crucified, the next day he says, a new commandment I have given to you that you should love one another the way I have loved you. And then he proceeds to wash their feet. Actually, he washes their feet and then makes that commandment clear for them. It is the commandment to love one another as we have been loved that forms the central kind of principle around which the entire letter of John revolves. Loving one another is an essential way in which we demonstrate to the world that we know Jesus. He says, whoever claims to know him but then fails to obey his commandments is a liar. Because whoever says, I abide in him, should walk in the way that he walks. That idea of abiding also comes straight out of that same 15th chapter where Jesus is talking to his disciples and giving him, as it were, his last instructions before he's gone. He says, I'm the vine. You're the branches. Abide in me and you will bear much fruit. That it is not our own energy, but it is Christ's energy and life that flows through us that enables us to do what Christ did. It enables us to live as Christ lived. It is not just by our own effort, but it is as we connect ourselves, link ourselves, graft ourselves into Christ, that we are able to abide and then live out of the life that flows from Christ. 
By contrast, John says, whoever says, I am in the light, I abide in the light, and yet hates a brother or sister, is actually still in the darkness and walks in the darkness and not in the light. But one who loves a brother or sister lives in the light. He's using these various images of light and darkness, of loving and hating, and saying, gang, if we really are in Christ, then we need to live congruently so that the way we treat each other is the way in which Christ treats us. <clears throat> Congruence is challenging, though, isn't it? It is challenging to walk the talk all the time. I really think that Jesus' authority as a teacher came from the congruence of his words and his actions. Jesus' teaching, as he went from town to town, people often exclaimed, wow, he's different. He teaches with authority, whereas the other teachers don't. Well, a little window into what that means comes in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 23, when Jesus talks very explicitly about incongruity. He's talking about the religious leaders. And honestly, these are some of the harshest words that come out of Jesus' mouth. And they're not for prostitutes, or tax collectors, or common sinners. That's not who he speaks harshly toward. He speaks harshly toward religious leaders who don't walk the talk. Hear what he says. The teachers of the law and Pharisees sit, at Moses seat, sit in Moses' seat. So you must obey them and do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do. For they do not practice what they preach. Wow. They tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for others to see. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut up the kingdom of heaven in others' faces. You yourselves do not enter, and you will not let anyone else enter that wants to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when you get one, you make them twice as much a son of hell as you are. Those are not easy words. But it is interesting that Jesus doesn't speak those words to the common riffraff. He speaks them to the folks who pretend to have it all together, but who live otherwise. We all know what that's like, at least at some point in our lives, including me. Jesus calls out that incongruence because he understands that when we live a life that, that purports one thing and that acts out of a different place, we do not live whole. We do not live honest. We do not live integrated. And so he challenges us to be whole. To be whole. There are lots of examples that we can give from our own lives and others. I think of the story of one of my good friends who was sexually abused every Sunday morning by an elder in his church who was an upstanding member of the community, but who would sneak out and take advantage of him while his father was preaching on Sunday. Pillar in the church, sexual abuser. I think about less painful and horrible examples. I, early in my ministry, when I was forming a worker-owned restaurant cooperative called Lo Nuestro, and one of my coworkers called me aside at one point because 
I have been saying in the meetings of the co-op over and over again, look, you guys own this, you guys make the decisions. This is your business, you make the choices. And then they'd make a choice that I didn't like and I'd run around the back and I'd change the decision and I'd make it different. And finally, Wes called me aside and he said, Rob, they can't listen to your words because your actions are speaking so loudly. You're doing the very thing that contradicts what you're saying and not giving them the voice that you tell them they have. Get it together. Or what about the time when, uh, as parenting, we grab our kid and we whack him on the hiney saying, I told you never to hit another child. A little incongruence there maybe? Just maybe? Or the time when my son Owen came to me at Pam and David Strain's house for one New Year's Eve celebration when David invited some of the guys out to smoke cigars and uh, I had taken two puffs on the cigar and Owen comes up and he says, Dad, you're going to die. You told me smoking was bad for you. How can you do that? And I went, <laughs> incongruence called to my attention. Or how about the situations like uh, when you as a pastor or an elder say to someone who comes to you, can you keep this in confidence? And you say, sure. And then next Sunday they discover that the whole church knows what they told you because you couldn't keep your mouth shut. We all know incongruence, <coughs> but there's some good news here too. It's not just a lashing. The good news is that God has given us a way to put the split pieces back together again. And that's called confession and forgiveness. It's the admitting the truth when someone points it out or when we examine our own selves and we notice the disparity between what we say and what we do. And we do the hard work to admit <coughs> and to weave back together the pieces that have been split. <coughs> it's not easy, but it's what Jesus calls us to. Because it's the only way we can be whole. It's the only way we can be whole. There's an organization here in the West Side American Indians of Texas, and they do a retreat with young men in the community. It's called Hoven Nobly. And they take these young men out on retreat, and one of the first tasks that they do is they create a plaster mask of their face. And then they say, okay, on the outside, I want you to paint this to show, you know, to show who you are. What's your, you know, what's your public face? Who are you in the world? And many of them draw faces that are all about their strength and their capacity. And they go around and they tell about what they've done. And then they say, okay, now take your mask and turn it over and look at the inside. And I want you to write with this marker how you really feel about yourself. And they talk about how fragile and vulnerable they feel. How they feel like they're not loved by people that are important in their lives. They write about the brokenness that they carry inside. And the rest of the retreat is an attempt to say, how can we bring these two together so that we can be who we are wherever we are? And not one person here and another person here. My pastoral care professor, uh, <clears throat> Reverend Oglesby, said the great struggle in our lives, the big problem in our lives, is that we walk around comparing everybody else's public projection to our insides. 
We're comparing our public, our inner, our inner reality to the public face that everybody else puts up. That's so nice. We've all heard how Facebook has, they've studied Facebook and how people get depressed by going to Facebook because everybody puts all their happy, happy up on Facebook. Yeah. But the truth is we don't all live happy, happy all the time. No. And if all I see about everybody else is they're happy, happy, and I'm living my crappy, crappy. <laughs> I don't feel like I'm the same kind of person, right? I must be less than. Congruence is what Jesus invites us to. The chance to bring the insides and the outsides together so that we can be whole. And it's not easy. It's not been easy in my life. And I know it's not easy for you. But it's what God calls us to. Because when we live that wholeness, that authenticity, that congruence, the power of it becomes much more available to work through us. Let us pray. Lord, we know. We know there are areas of incongruence in our in our lives, perhaps in our personal lives, perhaps in our work lives, perhaps in our parenting, you know, you know. And so today we ask for the grace to be able to see ourselves clearly, to be able to seek your forgiveness and that of others. So that when we love, it may be genuine and authentic. So that when we love, Christ may shine in our loving. For in your name we pray. Amen. 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 <laughs>
grace and with mercy. Grateful for the forgiveness that is extended to us at every moment of our lives. Grateful for a community of faith where we can learn together to live authentically. Let us return our thanks with the gift of our tithes and our All the way.